Greetings, everyone. This is Sharice Brewington Clark, <clears throat> Chairperson of the Workforce Development Committee meeting, and welcome to our second meeting. And just before we uh, get started, we uh, have an advisory that we need to read uh, regarding our virtual meeting. So I'm going to ask our Vice Chair, Frank Burton, if he would read that now for us. Frank? Yes. As co chair of the Workforce Development Subcommittee in the Law Enforcement Accountability Task Force, in accordance with the passage of HCR 85, adopting rules of procedure for conducting virtual meetings of the General Assembly and its legislative committees during an emergency, this public body is author authorized to meet virtually. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting in accordance with HCR 85. We are utilizing Zoom webinar for this virtual meeting. All members of the subcommittee have the ability to communicate contemporaneously on this platform. Should any subcommittee member experience technical difficulty, please call 302-519-4629. That's 302-519-4629. Public may listen and participate in this meeting by registering via me meeting link that is posted on the General Assembly's website. The public may also observe this meeting through a live stream available on YouTube. A link to the live stream can be located on the General Assembly's website. Public comment is permitted at the close of the meeting. Public attendees in the Zoom webinar must utilize the raised hand function to be permitted to speak and should be called on in the order which the hands were raised. Members of the public will be unmuted and given two minutes to speak. Public Comments can also be submitted in advance up to 24 hours after this meeting by emailing leotaskforce at delaware.gov. In the event that the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that any votes that may be taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. So let's begin today's meeting by taking a roll call attendance of the subcommittee members present Subcommittee members shall ensure that their cameras remain on for the entirety of the meeting to the best of their ability. When your name is called, please unmute your mic and affirm your attendance. Once you've be, been recorded as present, please mute your device for the dur duration of the roll call. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Frank. I am now looking for our listing of official attendees. Just give me a moment here. And I will pull that up so we can call on those of you who are here in attendance. One second. One moment. Okay, I'm gonna start with <clears throat> uh, those of you who are in attendance last meeting. Um, Chief R.L. Hughes. Here. Thank you. Representative Ruth Briggs King. Present. Paige Chapman. Present. Thank you. Jane Hovington. Jane Hovington. I thought I saw her on earlier. I, I'm here. Uh, I just have someone in front of me. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Chief Tory James. Here. Thank you. Ann Farley. Ann Farley. Kaylin Richards. Present. Thank you. Major Sean Marardi. I'm present, ma'am. Thank you. Brian Moore. Present. Okay. Abdullah Muhammad Bay. Abdullah Mohammed Bay, Sandra Smithers, Sandra Smithers. All righty, so we're going to see now who else is on here. We have one second here. I just saw Alexandra Ramirez. Present. Thank you. 
Who else are we missing here? Who else am I missing? That's on the call for today. Of course, Frank Burton. Present. Corey, uh, Corey Wright. Corey Wright. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Who else am I missing here? These are the persons that are present. All that haven't spoken obviously are not present. We'll record them as not in attendance of the meeting right now. And then I am also seeing, of course, I am present, Sharice Brewington Carr. And we'll move now to our meeting minutes. Just before, oh, let's go back one. Um, I always like to start um, uh, just in terms of just helping to give us a motivation as it relates to our work. And this is one of my favorite quotes here. And I just want to remind us in general, as we go forward, uh, lots of work to be done and what have you, but I want to share this with you. And I'm sure many of you have seen this before as well. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens, that's you, can change the world and deal is only the, is the only thing that ever has. And this is by Margaret Mead. So as we begin our work and it's expansive work in and of itself, uh, we're looking very forward to working with you, continuing to work with you and knowing we're gonna get much done even though it is a small group consider, considering the task. And just before getting to the meeting minutes, I noticed that we do have on the line here are one of our uh, law enforcement uh, accountability task force chairs, uh, Representative Franklin Cook. And I wanna give him a moment um, to, to, to offer us a few words. Representative Cook, I see you. Yes, I'm here. Mm -hmm. First, good afternoon. It's an honor to be here and I appreciate each and every person that is uh, here today. Uh, we're doing tremendous work and we want to just keep it up and keep everybody lively, keep everybody focused on what we're about. And uh, I'm, I'm getting great reviews, great things, and we just want to keep it up. I know we're going to hit some, some barriers and things, but we're going to work through it and we're going to get it done. And, and, and you know, let's just keep it up and, and thank you for, for being here. I appreciate, appreciate each and every person that's on here today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, and let's see here. I'm just looking at my notes here because, and I also want to say shout out to the staff too. I see Sarah over there, uh, Sarah Wooten, our deputy chief of staff. Alexa is on and who else am I missing on here? Is Raleen on and others. They have done a yeoman's job, not only for this committee, uh, as late as earlier today, we've spoken and we've texted and email and they're texting me as we speak, telling me things that I'm doing correctly or not correctly <laughs> as we're going along. Uh, but just wanna say thank you so much for the support that they're providing, not only to this group, to the task force chairs and all the other committees as well. So just wanna say thank you so much. They're doing all the work behind the scenes and thank you so much to DTI for keeping us together as well. Of course, we all know that we are functioning in a different environment these days with COVID-19. So. I'm sure all of you are just like I am to some degree, a bit of Zoom exhausted uh, in our virtual world in and of itself and which very much that we could spend time directly with you and interact directly with you. Uh, but this is where we are right now. So thank you so much for allowing us your space and your time. And in some instances, your homes, probably your office settings, your pets, your children and whomever else would like to join us <laughs> during this process. Um, and we're working remotely and being at home. So thank you all so much for, for what you're doing. Next slide. Our agenda is as, as such, and I wanna adopt the agenda before we continue to move forward as well. Um, uh, first and foremost, the, the notice that you heard um, uh, my co-chair, uh, Reverend Burton speak to, we will read that before every meeting. One of the things that we've done is, is that we're consistently reviewing our policies and procedures and practices as it relates to FOIA or Freedom of Information Act to make sure that we're in compliance. And again, learning much about this continual virtual world to make sure we have um, um, uh, transparency and access to the public in general. So uh, you will hear that and hear that over and over again uh, as we meet. So I'm so sorry for that, but you, you will hear that just to remind us all about what we're to do and how we're to do it. Um, and uh, we will now entertain the approval of the meeting minutes. And we hope that you all receive, we know that you all received the meeting minutes prior to uh, this session and would ask now um, if, if you all would, uh, if you get a motion to adopt, if you read them and if there's any changes other than grammatical changes 
uh, any content, any persons missing, perhaps maybe from uh, attendance uh, that were not. I did see one thing I saw Ann Frawley identified as being in attendance twice. Not sure how you do that, but I'm sure that was just a, a, a small typo. Um, so if we could um, uh, make adjustments for that, but any other things that we see on there that are critical, if you please would um, share those things at this particular time. Has everybody seen the minutes? Okay, had time to read them. All right, very good. So can I have a uh, motion to adopt the minutes, please? Here's oh. the motion. Thank I'll... you, Major. Can I have a second? I second the okay. motion. I'm sorry, who was the second? I second it. Okay, thank you, Frank. Thank you very much. So the uh, the the minutes have been, uh, it's been moved in a, in, a, in a second there. So we'd like to um, call it all in favor. Any questions? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Aye, thank you. Wave your hand, give me a thumbs up. Any not approved? All right, very good. The minutes have been called in. So I think we've squared away some aspect of administrative business. So if we could, and as we asked before, any of you who are actual uh, committee members, if you would please turn your cameras on if you're able so that we can see, see you, that would be really good. And I also see down here that uh, another one of our co-chairs, uh, task force co-chairs have joined us. There are Parsons down there. So Daryl, you're on the hook. Uh, Representative uh, Cook gave a few remarks and I'd like very much for you to um, open up if you will. And uh, there you go, there he is, one of our illustrious leaders there. And if you could um, say hello to this group and, and share any thoughts that you might have about the scope of this work or just in general where we are as a task force. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, apologize for my uh, lateness as many of you can uh, I guess are personally aware trying to juggle your, your day job with these requirements. Uh, so I had to deal with some uh, Department of Education work earlier today and through this afternoon. Again, so I am very appreciative of all of you sharing your time uh, to do this on behalf of the citizens of the state of Delaware. You have, uh, you know, it's not a Herculean task, but it is a big task. And it is one of the tasks I think will have uh, generational impact. Uh, so I know uh, Representative Cook thanked you. So I just wanna add my thanks to you and my confidence in each and every one of you to actively participate in this process uh, as we move forward. So thank you again. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, next slide. So many of you, and we told you all that for the last meeting that we were going to also do an outreach to you and um, just uh, make a phone call between Frank and myself to, to all of you um, to, to get to know you also to uh, you know just get a general sense, say hello and what have you in connection as it relates to the committee. I think we've called everyone um, on here. Uh, we've talked to a number of you. We've left messages for the rest of you and um, you know, we may call you again. So in other words, what Frank and I are saying is, is that don't duck us, <laughs> answer the phone. <laughs> answer the phone, we're just outreaching you and, and having some time together other than just in these meetings and what have you. Part of our, uh, part of our reason for, uh, for outreach too was not only to just to get to say hello and, and make a, a personal contact, but also to talk a bit about our work scope and um, some consideration about potentially where you could assist or where you might have interest. Um, as, as our uh, co-chair has said, uh, Daryl and certainly Representative Cook, Cook knows as well, is, is that there's a lot, there's a huge amount of work that goes into each one of these um, uh, subcommittees. And our sub subcommittee, we thought in terms of looking at the uh, scope of the work or the, the expansion of the work in and of itself. And there's so many subjects that come up under workforce development that we needed to identify them by task. Our first meeting, we talked about it in the scope of describing them at that time, our thought process was work groups. What we understand in terms of that uh, definition as it relates to work groups or groups within a groups does not meet the requirements of FOIA or it could meet the requirements of FOIA if we set you aside and 
had you meeting separately. We don't really want to do that because again, it gets back to our uh, concern about transparency and making sure that the public knows everything that we're doing and that they're able to attend and participate as well as the press and whomever else. So we thought, uh, rethought and were advised accordingly that separating out into separate groups, not only would it be difficult for Frank and myself to split ourselves, but also to make sure that at any point in time that the public would wanna have access and et cetera, we would be operating as multiple mini groups. And we didn't necessarily wanna do that. This is one uh, full committee uh, in and of itself or subcommittee uh, in and of itself workforce development who has many, many, many tasks um, attached to it. So we're gonna identify the work and the scope as tasks and ask you all to uh, continue to lend yourself and self-volunteer to uh, have your interests. And a number of you have already self-identified certain areas that you wanna work in. We're gonna go over that more specifically so that perhaps for some of you who had questions or thoughts about um, the, the task, formerly work groups that we were sharing, uh, what we wanted to do and what we were thinking in terms of the scope of that work, that after the discussion today, you might have a better understanding and be able to ask any questions or make adjustments so you can make a decision about what area or particular task that you wanna work on. So let's go over, I wanna go over the overview of the task and what our intent is. And I think we sent this out, it was a long email. So we're just gonna go over it again and what have you so you know. So our, our thought again was is that our committee would take on tasks, a number of different tasks to inform our work as a full group. So any information, any detail, any content uh, that you uh, perhaps maybe would like to share or you might investigate would come back into the larger group uh, and we'll schedule that over time. And I, I'll, I'll stop there for a minute because I want Representative Cook to mention to the group as well. We have a timeline or an interim timeline. So Frank, can you talk to them a bit about our your thoughts and, and you shared with the, with the subcommittee co-chairs about um, you know looking at trying to get to a point to perhaps maybe share some uh, information with our your colleagues in the general assembly. Where is what's our time frame? Well, right now we're looking at uh, 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 possibly giving um, the general assembly or the, not the general assembly the, the, the membership uh, a little a little speck of what we're doing and where we're going, so they know where we're at right now. I would say in the mid midway point. And uh, we're looking maybe into uh, before the General Assembly ends in 2021 of presenting everything if we get that far and get done. Okay. So, so we're looking at maybe uh, uh, maybe March, maybe maybe April. Okay. Uh, depends on what we're doing here at, at, at the General Assembly here down at Lake Hall, how we're proceeding with our uh, task here. And, and right now everything is still in limbo, but they're working on things right now. So. I want to make sure through all of our uh, subcommittees that we cross our T's and dot our I's. And, you know, we're not the rabbit, we're the tortoise. Mm -hmm. We're not in a big hurry. We want to make sure we do things right and that we represent the people of the state of Delaware with this task force and what we're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And again, so, so I think all of us wanted to give you that, um, that, that worldview of we do have some interim deliverables. Representative Cook and also uh, Co-Chair Parsons have some deliverables as well, or some expected deliverables around looking at uh, specifically around trying to get to some interim information and checking in, so to speak. Um, our goal in, in and of itself, and you see as we get to this, is that we want to look at a first look of information um, that you, you all can contrive and look at. That'll help inform where we go next and then ultimately be able that we can give out content and information to our co-chairs and begin to formulate some uh, consensus and some thought processes around what we're seeing in the field and, and what ultimately this is beginning to shape up. So, and you, you, you heard a representative say that, you know, we're methodically doing this. We're not looking to get to a hurry to get an answer. We're looking to, where are we? I think perhaps maybe some check-ins. Um, as we as we go along. So all of you will be very helpful in that process. So we'll get back to our subcommittee uh, report and, and what we think areas will help to inform that. And they are professional development, recruitment and workforce retention. That's one particular area. And we're gonna go, let's go back. We're gonna go over each one of these so you can see what we think right now are some of the task areas in each one of those. Then the next one would be 
uh, category would be police incidents of physical engagement and violence. That's our interactions and what have you in engagement with police. Next area would be funding and capacity, looking at what capacity they have and funding opportunities or funding access that they have or actual funding that they've received. And the last one would be general operating policies, procedures, and code of conduct, it's kind of like a catch all about how do you do what you do and et cetera. So we'll go into that. We're asking all of the members of the committee to actually um, identify, and a number of you have already identified areas that you want to work on, areas that you have interest in and information. We want everyone to do that because it's going to take each of us contributing to that, our thoughts processes, and also doing the inquiry and investigations around this work and reviewing uh, current data that may already be out there to be able to help uh, bring that back to the larger group. So we'll have that uh, detail. Um, so that's what we're looking at. And again, the purpose is, is we want everybody to be active participants in researching, uh, learning, also making sure that we have some uh, comparative data. You know, we're not uh, comparing uh, apples to apples in many instances when you're looking at, you know, from one end of the state to the other, and then also sizeability and various issues that are impacting uh, some of our law enforcement entities across the state. And again, ultimately we want to, at the end, we talked before about truth telling, but want to be able to get a factual uh, report and information that we're providing to our co-chairs, our law enforcement accountability task force co-chairs that they will be sharing as well. That's factual, data-driven, uh, and also looking very much at uh, best practices potentially that might work here and also identifying opportunities for improvement as we go along. The scope of the work is every police entity in the state of Delaware that we can contrive and, and receive information on. So there's no entity that we would not look at. And that's everything from very, very small volunteer all the way up to uh, our larger uh, police entities and law enforcement entities as, as well. So I'll stop there and ask if there's any questions about the overview and understanding as it relates to, to where we wanna do as it relates to the task. Is it, is it clear to everyone or does it make sense to everyone that we approach and we look at things in this way? Ma'am, I do have one question. It's yes, Sean. by all means. So task number two, I'm a little bit confused with that one in regards to police incidents of physical engagement. In regards to the larger overall task force, I think that the one of the groups is actually looking at use of force. Are they synonymous? Is there a different avenue that you like to pursue? I'm just not well. Sure. I, I would say to you, Major, that um, when, when we looked at that, it wasn't so much as looking at. Um, I think they're looking at use of force in and of itself. We all know that there are also incidences and engagement uh, with the police that are not necessarily um, resulting in a use of force action. And so from that perspective, what, what does that mean? What does it mean in and of itself? It could very well be that I don't think we're gonna end up looking at exactly the same things, but we probably are looking at some aspects of some of the same things um, to some degree. Um, and so that was my thought. It wasn't just a use of force, but you know what, what's causing physical engagement? And in my mind, physical engagement might very well be is someone aggressing the police? Is someone, you know, something happening perhaps maybe to uh, property uh, that belongs to the police or, or what have you, or vice versa? What things are really creating uh, engagement? Frank, is that is that clearer of what we were thinking about that? Yep, that is exactly clear. We're just looking at um, not necessarily the uh, use of force, but different things that uh, cause it to occur. Okay, Chief Hughes, I see you got a puzzled look on your face. Is that making sense to you? <laughs> you gave away, you gave yourself away. Is it making sense? I yes, it is making sense, but I I am a little confused, which I am always confused. So everyone, that is my normal puzzled look. <laughs> uh, but I was thinking around. I was thinking about workforce development and the training that goes into when I first read that the kind of training that are, we are providing to our new police officers, to our uh, current police officers around physical engagement and violence and, and perhaps even de-escalation works its way into that. That's the way I was looking at it, not so much from examining the incidents, but from the training that we were going to be trying I, to do. That. I think there are, two, there, there are two separate things and they're relevant to each other. So I agree with you. I completely agree with you is that ultimately, I think that as we begin to look at 
you know, kinds of incidents and what have you, to me, the breadcrumbs might lead us back to, well, what's happening with the training? So okay. we'd be looking at both of that. Um, so that you make a very, very good point is that we're not just looking at the outcome is like, how do we get there? You know, is it, is it an issue of um, training and retraining or non-training or, you know, uh, tenure of an individual, perhaps maybe on the job, all those kinds of things that might show up in that way that might ultimately get to X, if, if that makes sense. Major, is that, is that helping you a little bit more? So it is. Okay, go ahead. Keep going. Let's go. And I apologize. So that's all right. I'm looking actually at the PowerPoint. I'm looking at the guideline and uh, the specific bullet points. So and we're going to get right there to that too. I think you, you all are jumping a little ahead here. So give well, me a minute. We're going to get there, but go ahead. If you have a question right now. No, no ma'am. I'll wait till we get there. All right. Okay. Good enough then. Cause that's what exactly what we want to have happen is let's blush it through. And when we were thinking about um, the formerly thing known as work group, we were thinking about you all doing exactly what you're doing right now. So I'm glad that we're having this group think, so to speak, um, and feedback from all of you, because what if you're not working in those various groups or various entities or independently by yourself, now it's good for us to have a common understanding and, and I appreciate that in a, in a big way. Any other general thoughts? And I see Ann has joined us. Hi, Ann. Ann Farley has joined us. So thank you, Ann, for joining us. I Any apologize other... for being late. Um, it's all thank right. you quite, for welcoming. Quite, no problem. Quite, quite, quite all right. Yes, Representative Ruth King, uh, Kings. Thank you. I have a rep. Just a question. And it seems like, you know, that each of the um, subgroups of the task force have some different assignments. And some of those are going to overlap. Mm -hmm. And has there been any coordination as to the report format so that we're sort of doing things um, very similar to each other so that by time we're done, we will maybe derive a vision statement, a mission statement and strategies and our group would have its strategies, but so that we're using sort of the same format, not only for our benefit, but for the public as well, that will be trying to follow the pathway that we're doing, because obviously there's there's going to be strategies and recommendations. Some of those will overlap. Will we prioritize them similarly or, or so forth? And so, for instance, I can't help but believe that financing and money are going to be an issue for uh, across the board here because it has every impact from how you're recruiting to how you're compensating um, to how maybe you're equipping or training or whatever. But I can see that overlapping in so many areas. And so I just didn't know if we had that kind of um, oversight, if you will, that big thought to how we're going to take the journey with the other subcommittees to have this really comprehensive mm -hmm. feel to when we're done. I'll have uh, Representative uh, Cook speak to that. And just before he does, I will tell you that the very thing you talked about, uh, Ruth, is that uh, we have come together as co-chairs of the various committees to make sure that we're kind of singing on the same sheet of page and that if there's something that happens in this group, that belongs in another group or something that happens over at, at that particular committee belongs over here with us that we're sharing that data. And I, I do believe that we want to move to a place of just what you said is that what is going to be something that is uh, comprehensive and uh, uh, understandable so that when people look at it, it's something that is actually user friendly and et cetera. So, so uh, Frank, you want to talk to that a bit? Y yes, you, you, you said it, you hit the nail right on the head. Uh, we, and we'll have more meetings, so we, we'll, we'll be able to go over this overlapping as Representative uh, Briggs King is talking about. And like uh, uh, Co-Chair uh, Shreese Brown and Carr had just said, we already had one meeting. We'll have plenty of more to make sure everybody is focused and stay in their lanes. So yes, yeah. we, we will have more. So they are a little bit overlapping, and, and we do have that, and we're working yeah. on it, yes. Yeah, so Ruth, as you, as you if, if, if you don't mind, uh, as I, if I call you Ruth versus representative, <laughs> it's okay. No, as, as, I, as you're, you make a very, very good point in that um, we're all working, we're, we're working together as co-chairs of the group and meeting with Frank and with Daryl to make sure that we are, while we're doing very uh, different aspects of work that we're not working in silos, so to speak, because everything is interconnected. So um, in that regard, I think that we'll, we'll be pleased with the product and to your point, uh, we have all asked as co-chairs that we come up with something and we're working towards something that is concise and that we, we know exactly what the deliverables are so that we're all informing that in a, um, in, a in an academic way, <laughs> in a strategic way and et cetera. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Any other thoughts about the, the overview of the task 
the the purpose, the aim, and the scope of the work so far before we get to the specifics. And and so I'm looking for Major and Chief to as we get to these uh, specifics to give give us the business and uh, to tell us more about what's there and what's not there. And that was part of what we wanted to do in these meetings. Also, is to make sure this was just out of Frank and my thought about you know our background and things that we have been kind of hearing and what have you, we need to hear from you. Is it is it jiving? Is it making sense? Or we need to add additional things to it or in, in going forward. Okay, let's move on to the next. Here's what we wanna look in terms of outcomes in general, is that uh, in any of the work that we do, uh, ultimately, again, we're looking at uh, the reporting aspect of it as a comparative analysis. So. Um, it, when you're looking at funding issues and capacity issues, one entity is not going to get one one thing that another one ultimately would get, depending on what the needs are and et cetera. So how do you compare that uh, in terms of what our thought process, as you all give us information, we'll be able to share that detail. Other than just giving the detail, how do you compare what the needs are in one particular aspect of law enforcement agency versus another agency that needs something more? And is it uh, equitable? When you look at the fact that they both, both perhaps potentially might have the same requirements and outcomes, but they're ill-equipped. It's probably, I would equate it similar to uh, the dialogue that you hear at times about underfunded schools. And, but the expectation is everybody's supposed to meet the same educational requirements, but one school gets this and one school gets that. Uh, we would say probably it's that way in most of, of what we do in governance and in world. And we certainly expect that that's what we may see as it relates to law enforcement, but let's see what that looks like in general. That was just one example. Uh, regional, national certifications and associations. This gets back to in part helping us to tell the story. And this again looks at outcomes. Do people know that uh, law enforcement entities in the state has XYZ accreditation and what that accreditation is and means in the law enforcement industry and community in and of itself. The fact that it has weight um, nationally internationally perhaps and what those associations are in and of itself. I often find in my own work and what have you is that Delaware is not doing so bad oftentimes on a good day when you look at what's happening nationally, locally, regionally and what have you, but we're so busy doing the work at times we don't tell those stories, but it would be good to get an idea about what those things are and accreditations. Our accreditations are issues that we wanna look at perhaps potentially um, most of them have some type of uh, finance that's associated with it. So what does that mean if we want to have a, a grade A or a gold standard law enforcement entity and we want to go through an accreditation process, do they have the resources in order to be able to do that and meet those goals and needs and objectives? Just as an example, or associations where in many instances, associations along with associations come not only membership, their professional development opportunities, there's training opportunities, there's recruitment opportunities, there's all kinds of things that go along with the professional associations and what have you. And then recommendations, suggestions, and best practices. What's happening in the region, what's happening uh, locally, what's happening nationally, and what have you that might be a benefit of information that, that we know. And I remember uh, on our very first meeting, Brian talked about uh, a program that uh, he was excited about um, that, that was working towards, I think, working with youth, right, Brian? Yeah, shake his head, yes, right? So, so you know, those kinds of things that we see that may be uh, applicable, uh, Delawareize it, if you will, but applicable uh, to what we do here or something that we might wanna support here in the state. We don't know until we start, you know, looking at those kinds of things and maybe making those suggestions. If nothing else, developing a resource list and an entity of things that we can look at at a goal ultimately to get to, if it's not, something that you want to do now, or we would want to do now, but something perhaps maybe we could look to in the future. So that's the scope of looking at uh, the task outcomes as you, as you begin to look at these things and what have you, if you could consider bringing the information back in that scope, in that particular format would be really, really helpful to us to understand it. Next slide. So task number one, big, big subject here, professional development, recruitment and workforce Retention. And again, a number of you um, have indicated some first choices and second choices. And so here we thought some of the topical areas that uh, would go in this particular um, uh, uh, frame here is subject is training and curricula. And that means, you know, how frequently the training happens. What is the training? Uh, regulations. Is it required versus elective? I can do it if I like to. If I don't want to do it, then fine. Do I have to do it? 
if it's something that ultimately um, may lead to promotion or not? Is just is it okay that I don't do it? I mean, what are what are things that are required versus mandatory? Are there some things that perhaps maybe potentially might be mandated by uh, contract or by your HR department or or whatever? Those kinds of things could be things like fitness for duty. I don't know what that looks like, but it could be a whole host of things. But what is that? What's the sequence in the progression? You know, you know, how often is it offered? Is it something that people couldn't? Even if they wanted to, they wouldn't be able to take it for a period of time because you don't have the training capacity or the training facilities or whatever those issues might present themselves. Do you get a certification when you finish? Is the certification just a certificate or is it a credential that you actually get that might lend itself to an opportunity for you know, promotion or um, you know, those kinds of things? That's one particular area. Under recruitment, hiring, and retention strategies, what what is that? You know, what's your the turnover, and is the turnover does the turnover uh, look a certain way in terms of the demographics? What does it mean in terms of um, you know what's your recruitment, hiring, and retention as it relates to gender? You know, age is a particular. If you look at your workforce, I think someone mentioned in our last session that we were very interested in what the next succession is going to be of tomorrow's law enforcement um, professional. What is that gonna look like in and of itself? And are we gonna get there? Um, age, you know, looking at that, looking at race, what does it mean in terms of diversity? Does everybody look the same, you know, and within our uh, policing entities, if that's the case, then why? You know, those kinds of things. And the length of service, what's your tenure? Which feeds back into succession planning or ultimately says if you've got a workforce that the, the average um, uh, length of tenure is like two to five years, you've got a relatively young workforce, you know, you might be in good shape or you might need to have a different aspect of looking at how you train and all of those kinds of things and et cetera. Or if your turnover is such that you're not able to hold on to persons, what ultimately might that mean? These are some of the kinds of things potentially that we'd like to, to look at, pay attention to, or ultimately see what the data tells us about what's happening in Delaware. Uh, promotional policies and procedures. How does that happen? Um, you know, what does it look like in terms of people who are able to, you know, to achieve the rank of our major in chief here? What does that look like in terms of persons moving in that direction? If you've got a, a workforce that's two to five years, then who's the chief, who's the major? How, how do those things happen in and of itself? And what does that look like by gender? What does that look like by age? What does that look by, like by race? And again, it gets back to the length of service. But looking at you know, what does that look like? What does that shape up and look like in terms of the workforce? Uh, one thing that's come up too is, is that when we talk about recruitment, where do we recruit from? Are we recruiting from our communities? Are we able to recruit from our communities? What does that look like in and of itself? Um, next thing is, is that our workforce uh, complement the number of personnel, who's there, uh, who, you know, uh, what ultimately is, again, get back to the demographics, um, the gender, the age, the race, uh, and the length of service uh, there, you know, is important to know. What's the complement in and of itself? Sure. From, yes, go right ahead. Someone had a question. Charisse, yes. Um, yes, if I may, um, just under the recruitment and the workforce yes. where you're talking about gender and age and race, mm -hmm. if we would add ethnicity as well, as well, okay. and you mentioned community, yes. um, that, that we are uh, indeed making efforts to recruit from the community, people who know the community. Uh, I think that does a lot in building trust and legitimacy mm -hmm. um, in, in the law enforcement. And um, if we could add that in there, maybe. Absolutely. Some. Absolutely. Very, very good. Thank you so much for that. And this is why it's good, again, in this dialogue that, again, this is out of our thought processes about it and in talking with some of you, but even more so as we look at this, what's missing? What's there? Did you have something, Ruth? I did. I wanted to say that um, I've gone through just so much of the data that we received a few weeks ago and the surveys and the reports that came back. And one of the things that really stuck out to me that I took a note on under recruitment was how many of um, just about all of the different divisions and agencies in Delaware were talking about how they did a lot of recruitment by word of mouth. Mm. And that's very disturbing to me because I always find that rather than looking in the mirror, you should be looking out the window. Yeah. And so if yeah. the key vehicle that I'm using in my different agencies to recruit is to recruit someone I know or someone like me, 
then I'm not looking out the window wide enough. And that's mm -hmm. a very narrow span. Mm -hmm. And so that's, and I noticed it repeatedly in different agencies that were doing that. And I just thought that was something that we need to provide them some other methods or tools um, to be using to do their recruitment because otherwise you may not even know there's a position that you could apply for because it's been very internal. Very closed. Yeah, very closed and very, very internal. Yes, Major. So I'm just going to follow up with uh, Representative Ken. I think that's a, a great point to raise, uh, but there might be a little bit of misinformation there. So when we talk about one of the many, many strategies of recruitment, we talk about word of mouth. Well, don't forget the, the active and community engagement with multiple areas in our communities. So of all the community outreach that we participate in all of the time, and we continue to grow and develop that, that's what we're also talking about, those interpersonal connections, those ability to speak to others and to say, listen, would, have you ever thought about law enforcement as a career? Uh, think about this. Maybe they've never been engaged in that conversation before. So it all becomes relevant in the topic. But I do agree that if there is a very kind of um, myopic view of what the world is and we're only looking at certain things, then that's too narrow-minded. We need to expand mm -hmm. that. But mm -hmm. uh, from, my, from my experience, at least with the, with the state police, is that we try to recruit from all, all areas. And it's not just a kind of this feel-good statement that I'm making. It's true. We're actually going out there into the communities, trying to engage in those interpersonal, direct conversations to bring people in. Mm -hmm. So we want to move from, and it's, I guess, probably you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because it is important about who you know, but it can't be only about who you know, right? Very good. Very good. That's a very, very important. So, and again, it gets back to, um, these are opportunities. I think it's just looking at ourselves, you know, is that the case or is that like a norm or something that is a, a part of the culture in law enforcement communities across the country? I would say it probably is. Uh, it may not just only be Delaware based, but based on our, our uh, local data, it is what it is. So thank you. Yes, Representative King. I was just going to say frequently what happens is you think that a person that knows the job, knows what it takes, um, is a good one to do that referral or to, you know, to try and recruit somebody in because they, they know a little bit about you or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so it's, it, it goes both ways. I, you know, I know that several of the agencies are going um, and casting that net far and wide to attract you know, mm -hmm. different. Um, but then there's some that are smaller than that that may not have the resources that are simply going by that. Um, you go with what you know, or, you know, they, they know the background on that person. So they might be a good fit because they don't have a criminal record, for instance. But meanwhile, there's, there's just other things I think to look at because it really did stand out to me as I was going over from one agency to one town to another town that we don't have a problem recruiting. We sort of do this. And I thought, warning, for me, it's a warning flag. So I just wanted yeah. to mention no, no, no. Very good point. Very good point. Thank you so much for uh, pro providing that feedback. It's, it's really, really good. Another topic in this area uh, around this whole professional development, recruitment, and, and workforce retention is like work shifts. You know, what, you know, do we have the standard eight to four, what, you know, it used to be for me, what, seven to three, three to 11, 11 to 12, or is, are we moved to 12 hour shifts? Or what in the world are we working as it relates to this whole COVID environment right now? And, you know, looking at the, those kinds of things are overtime policies. I also very much not only looking at overtime policies, but looking at involuntary overtime, which I'm sure all of you know what that is. Involuntary overtime is, is that your, you know, your shift, your person's not here, you don't get to leave. And so what does that mean in terms of ultimately contributing to um, you know, exhaustion, not only just physical and emotional exhaustion, but retention. If persons feel that, you know, I'm just going to get here, I'm the low man on the totem pole, perhaps maybe a low woman on the totem pole in terms of uh, looking at my tenure and what have you and how that shapes up in terms of some of our labor management agreements and what have you, you just stuck every day. What that means <laughs> in and of itself around people staying on the job or as soon as they get an opportunity to take that wonderful expertise that's been invested in them and take it to another state even, perhaps maybe or what have you, I don't know. But just thinking about how that ultimately may impact and if it's relevant to certain police entities or uh, forces and not others or what's happening in and of itself. We won't know until we really look at what that looks like. Um, I know for you all, and I don't know if we have any members of, of the media on today, and they're always welcome, but usually every year there is some type of, 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 of presentation that talks about who's making overtime in the state of Delaware. And what does that end up looking like? It's our 24 hour frontline 
you know, uh, law enforcement responders, correctional persons, uh, sometimes people in some of our 24 hour facilities and what have you. And in many instances, while some people would like to take uh, overtime, nobody really talks about the involuntary overtime and some of those things where you're just stuck and what kind of condition and, and we, you know, all of that. Um, I know in many instances, and in, in oftentimes when you have involuntary overtime or what have you, it may ultimately be a very unsafe working environment in and of itself. So just things to think about and to look about, look around and what have you, what are the practices and the protocols, you know, and et cetera. Um, also incidences of disciplinary action. I like to call it corrective action, but if they're disciplinary action um, and disciplinary action could ultimately be, you start to see trends sometimes around disciplinary action. Is it happening more frequently in one entity and the other? And if it is uh, or not, you know, who is it happening to? What are the causal factors in terms of you know, who gets uh, corrective action versus who gets disciplinary actions, who's getting suspended, who's getting terminated, all of that. Is it progressive so that it moves up or is it heavy handed? We don't know. Terminations, demographics, again, getting back to what does that look like for gender, age, race, length of service and, and ethnicity? What is it looking like in terms of who's, who's getting what and how do we retain uh, and I like to call it, when I call it corrective action, restore people. How do we, what do we do if there's an error or an issue that requires some type of a corrective action that ultimately doesn't lead to uh, termination or shouldn't lead to termination? How do you restore that person, bring that person back and hold on to that person? Ruth, did you have something? I, I did. I was going to say that in, in perusing some of the stuff that we've been sent, I was really impressed. And I think it's probably from um, some some national standards, but it was a um, it was a personnel early warning system, which I think is very good. It's not necessarily that there's been a specific corrective action or disciplinary, but maybe it's a trend, and maybe that person's had some, you know, some family issues, uh, post traumatic stress, or something else. But it it looked to me to be a really good, and I'm sure that one of the law enforcement guys could, could probably tell us that it's out of C A L E A standards, and I just. That's the thing that it's in some departments, I see it, but not in all, but I just was really impressed with that early warning system, because I think that can be something that in turn affects some other behavior on the job. And I, I just was, um, I really thought it was a good policy. I like that too. And, and I, I think about it from the perspective is, is not only behavior on the job, culture on the job. If everybody thinks that, you know, oh, I'm gonna get it, or there's a problem or what have you, you know, what's what's happening at that? And to your point, you know, the early warning, getting to um, looking at the human resources, resources and support. Is EAP or whatever is called anymore being used to support and retain individuals versus, you know, it's the stigma that goes along. We know there's stigmas oftentimes that go along with that in and of itself, particularly in this particular industry. But ultimately after that, you know, how is it used in a way that it has credibility, respectability? Is it used frequently? Is it used at all? You know, what's going on as it relates to that? Is it by choice or what's going on? Um, and then we get to the emotional- Sh Sharice, yes, real Yes, yes. Who is that? I just, that's Frank. Hey, Frank, go ahead. Hey, I just wanted to say on this uh, incidences of disciplinary action, it's very, it's very important that we look at this because we see a lot of different things going on in the workforce, mm -hmm. especially law enforcement. Um, like you said, what, what groups are getting um, discipline for different things and what groups are not getting discipline mm -hmm. um, for different things, what groups are getting written up, what uh, groups are getting uh, citations for, for different things. Um, this is one of the things that we really have to look at uh, in terms of our workforce development because it goes on federal, state, and local police mm -hmm. departments where it, it becomes, a, um, becomes a problem. I, I'd like to think um, that, and my experience has been, is that you can track um, incidences of discipline and corrective uh, action oftentimes uh, to a, um, uh, a shift. You can track it to an individual sometimes. You can track it to um, the, the, the nomenclature of what's happening in a particular series of hours in the life of law enforcement or what have you. You know, those kinds of things can come up. But we don't know again until we begin to share what we what we see and investigate what we see. Emotional well-being uh, is is so important in this in this work. Um, and while it's talked about in and of itself, how do we uh, how is it uh, practiced, integrated, um, showcased and uh, showcased and supported? 
um, issues around post-traumatic stress. Uh, in the instance where we talked earlier about whether it was uh, incidences of, of, of police engagement or use of force or any of those violence or any of those things, what happens to that officer after they've had that experience? You know, how, 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 is, that, how is that managed in a way? Is it consistent across the state? Is it offered? Um, is it supported and what have you? Um, how are instances of, of, of substance abuse, substance use and substance abuse um, managed in and of itself? Um, you know, whatever that looks like. Fitness for duty um, and how those decisions are, are, are made, probably are very individual, but are there trends as it relates to fitness for duty and those kinds of things, leaves of absence, absence and, and use of leave and, and those kinds of things and what have you. Safety protocols, uh, family support um, in instances, you know, no entity, no officer comes to work alone by themselves. You know, what happens around those family dynamics and, um, you know, those kinds of things in and of itself. Chief, did you have something? I saw you lean up, you okay? All right, cool. Um, and then also looking at, we talked before about succession planning and the retirement pool. You know, what's that retirement pool looking like? Are we paying attention to it? Or all of a sudden, you know, you look up and everybody decided that, you know, I've had it with 2020, I'm out of here. And you, you, no one was prepared for it. Uh, and so, so what are you gonna do next year when you found, you know, your compliment has been severely depreciated and you don't have a recruitment strategy or you didn't realize this was coming, you didn't anticipate or expect that it was coming and what have you. What does that look like in terms of succession planning? So that's professional development, recruitment and workforce retention tasks and, and topical areas. As we were talking, was there anything else that came to mind? And I, I wanna think that atypically more is gonna come to mind as you begin to look at this, just like Ruth said, you know, you're reading through it and Anne is saying you're reading through it and it's like, okay, let's add this or let's, let's consider this and what have you. Any, any other thoughts right now? Therese, I would, yeah, only, uh -huh. this is, I would only add in the emotional well-being, um, just pulling it out separately, but critical incident stress management. I know it's it's something that we've kind of focused on a little bit, but uh, it's a little bit different from the long-term post-trauma, uh, but it's something that I'd be interested to see how each department is handling it. Okay, critical incident, say that again. Critical incident stress management. Okay, thank you. Thank you, we got it. All right, very good. Let's move on to task number two. Okay, so here we go. We're talking about the, the police incidents of physical engagement and violence. And we expanded that to, to say anything related to the policies of that. So the core areas, core topical areas be, be included, but not limited to guidelines. It gets back to our policies around the use of force and de-escalation strategies. You know, what are we doing as it relates to the training around those things? I think says a lot about, uh, to some degree, ultimately might lead to, well, what is the number of the thing that's happening? I don't know, but what are we doing as it relates to that? Uh, causal factors, frequency and number. Uh, and we talk about discharge of weapon, how often are we doing you know, weapons training and those kinds of, I, I don't know. I mean, we just don't know until we, it would be great to have a repository that says weapon training happens this particular uh, season in the life of the tenure of the officer. I don't know. We don't know. And, and again, whereas in, I would expect the chief and the chief and the major on here, myself and others uh, may know a little bit more about some of those. The general public has not a clue. And so again, I see this report in a big way as not only informing uh, general assembly, but this is a public report. I mean, people will know and have a better sense and know more about the public, a little more about the police than they ever knew before. And, and, and we hope that we're lifting the lid and giving them a better understanding about some of these things in and of itself. Um, uh, causal factor frequency and number in terms of injury to civilian and injury to civilian doesn't always the police didn't do it I mean what happened you know injury to civilian and those kinds of things and, and you know what they're exposed to and what have you what do you you know come 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 you know what do you 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 come upon if you if you will in and of itself and and what happens after that injury to officer causal factor frequency and number you know we talked about uh, we didn't talk about it yet, but I think all of you perhaps maybe have seen within the last 24 hours that there has been an uprising as a result of a, um, a, um, uh, a domestic, I think, a domestic dispute initially in the city of Philadelphia that yielded a, a casualty of the person who was yielding a knife, you know, working with the public and then also with a potentially, you know, towards the police. As a result of 
not knowing any of the facts, complete the facts, because the investigation is ongoing, the city of Philadelphia has erupted in that there are riots and things of that nature that are going on. The community is up in alarms, I think, about not only this, but lots of things uh, that's happening nationally. What we do know is, is that uh, my last report I heard was about 30 officers or so have been hurt, one with a broken leg and other things that are going on. So what's happening around uh, things that are directly related to an incident or, uh, or sub-related to an incident in and of itself, injury to officer. Uh, it could very well be even traffic kinds of thing. Who knows? But I don't know what, what happens there. Causal factors, frequency, and number of persons return to duty after these things happen. What, how do you return to duty? How do you, how do you come back to duty? And then also looking at um, uh, post-incident sequence and protocols. You know, once these things happen, what happens? Are people on administrative leave? When do they go administrative leave? What does that constitute? You know, are you still continuing to work? What happens around those kinds of issues? So I'll stop on, on that and ask now, Major, Chief, Chief, and anybody else that, um, hey, Keith, I see you were able to join us. So hi, thank you, and welcome to the meeting. Um, that anybody else, uh, any thoughts about those particular issues or those particular tasks, looking at those things within the scope of police incidents of physical engagement and, and violence? Uh, Sharice, this is Keith. Yeah. I, do, I do have a question as far as uh, access to that detail of information. Where, where will we find that? How will we source that? What's available to us? What we, what we are doing, uh, Keith, and again, a welcome, uh, what we are doing is, is that we have we've conducted a survey and asked a lot of information. Beyond that, this specific detail in and of itself, we have a whole listing of uh, the chiefs and heads of agencies across the state, and we're going to request the detail. And, you know, they, I think all of the chiefs and, and, and what have you have been advised about the scope of this work and et cetera, and it'll be provided to us. While it might not be provided to us in terms of the uh, a uh, specific individual will be able to get some of the demographic data like we talked about uh, in the slide before. I'm not sure if you were on yet, but looking at it from the perspective of, you know, gender, race, age, uh, length of service, those kinds of things and what have you. So we're going to make the ask uh, and, uh, you know, see what see what we get as it relates to 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 this detail. But we do have we do have the contact details so we can we can make those requests and get that content. This is Frankie. Yeah, go right ahead, Frank. I'm sorry, this is Frank again. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things in um, what you just mentioned, when we look at this, when we look at the causal factors and, it, and we look at the discharge of weapon as it relates to Philadelphia, and also how we talked about how things would overlap, one of the things that I heard, and they're still investigating, one of the things that I heard right before I came on, is that the officers that discharge their weapon did not have tasers because of the funding, so they hadn't been trained on tasers. So immediately somebody say would say, how come they didn't use uh, less, less than lethal uh, force with a taser? Well, they didn't have a taser because they weren't trained with tasers because they didn't have the funding to give them tasers. So again, this is another factor that we would be looking at in terms of why did the officers discharge their weapons? So, so I, I would say that, and thank you, Frank, for sharing that, is that that is very important. I don't know what we're going to find when we continue to look at what we're looking at. And again, this is not a who's who and who did something wrong. Um, ultimately, if you don't have a resource to get X, Y, and Z, but we don't know that that's the issue, then you can't expect the public or anyone to really know how did we get here. And so I'm hoping that we'll get that content and be able again to make the case for Delaware story as it is uh, and look at ways that we need to improve to reach that gold standard for safety for uh, public and community and safety for law enforcement as well. Major Chief and Chief, Chief Tory, you've been real quiet. <laughs> so <laughs> what do you think about some of these things when we're talking about this, um, this incident? We're not just looking at how come it's happening in your shop? But it's like, you know, where's the training? What's going on with that? I don't think we, we don't have a clue about any of that, but what are your thoughts around looking at some of this, this detail? You know, I think, I think we have to take it all into perspective as far as a lot of the, um, the areas of, of policing. Obviously policing here in Delaware is a lot different than what you're gonna see 
in Philadelphia and in some of these major cities. Um, you know, I can't answer for Chief Hughes or for, for the major, but, you know, I know in Smyrna, it's, it's very important and training um, is required, not just online, but there's hands-on and we kind of stay up on these things just to kind of make sure that we don't have these issues and that we follow up. Just like we talked about the uh, early reporting system, we've had that in place for probably over a year. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think a lot of places, a lot of departments in Delaware already have a lot of the things that we're talking about now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could very well be. And but is it in it? Is it in? I think that what I would hope that the co chairs um, and what we come to find is again, what does that mean as it relates to Delaware? And is it laid out any particular place that folks would be able to look at our law enforcement Bible, so to speak, and say, this is what's happening across the state or what's not happening and why? Um, you know, so, so that was a thought. Major, yes, John, what you think? So I think that these uh, topics are obviously very important, very relevant. I'm still confused though, and I apologize uh, mm -hmm. if uh, I'm just not getting it. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking at clearly the, the training as Chief Hughes mentioned, would I could see that definitely fall into this category of, of looking at where we are in the subgroup, right? Of training for de-escalation, training on response to resistance, AKA use of force. Um, and I understand about, you know, you're asking about firearms training and how that all, you know, relates the frequency of that training, what's involved in that training, the curriculum, all that. Mm -hmm. What I'm confused, same with the return to duty, following an incident of physical engagement. You know, what, what is the aftermath? What is the fitness for duty standards? What are the psychological standards? What is the uh, tying you back into what Brian talked about? What is the wellness? What is the critical incident stress management? Huge, huge roles. What I'm confused about are the two data sets or the three data sets of discharge of the weapon, injury to civilian and injury to officer as it relates to workforce development specifically. In other words, those data, uh, going to the, the last question that was asked a few seconds ago, that it was a great question, but where's this data gonna come from? Well, a lot of the data is gonna be available through at least aggregate data, not individualized as you mentioned, ma'am. So, but I don't see what the relevance is. I'm missing the connection in my mind anyway, to how it ties to this specific subgroup of the larger task force as compared to section one, uh, of the or, or subgroup one, not ours, but the other group. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm a little bit confused about. The other, the things about you know the, the aftermath, the training, and preparation for that, uh, all those things, the the wellness, the ability, the fitness for duty. Completely understand that. I just don't understand the data sets of the actual discharge of the firearm or the taser or the baton. How that ties into this particular area? If you could help me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'll try. Um, I guess what I think about is that I'm looking at not just me as an individual, but my thought process was um, the end game. The end game is that the discharge of weapons, just as an example, is X in this police entity. Where are the, what's the training, what's the training component that happens in uh, police agency X? And does, is there a correlation? I'm not assuming anything that it is. I'm not assuming that it's, it's one at all. I'm just saying that I feel that while our end game is not the number so much as it is what's happening over here and will the two marry itself? And who would help to marry that if we don't, if we don't at least have the conversation or discussion? We may decide as a group after we look at uh, the number of that would be provided, perhaps maybe potentially, because we're not looking at it in depth as, as others, that maybe that, that what we're doing is saying, this is a comport of information, and this is a comport of information over here. And we're not drawing the conclusions, but I just wonder, potentially, but I don't know if anybody else is, um, Frank or anyone else, Keith, perhaps if the two somehow, some way may be related. Keith, what are you thinking? I saw you raise your hand over there. We look, he's in school. He's uh, raising well, his hand. well, Brian, 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 Brian had his hand up before okay, me. Okay, go ahead, Brian. I'm sorry, I didn't see. You. Come. Yeah. Okay. I, I think I think to the major's point and what I see this coming from, and I think the general public, there's an impression out there that uh, that when the police investigate themselves or when the police investigate their own incidents, there's no follow up. And I think one of the ways that it could tie back to this work group is not just looking at incidents of the discharge of a weapon, but what's the debrief process? What's the lessons learned process? And 
you know, being able to enumerate to people that we do indeed change and, and some examples of how policies, procedures, and training have improved as a result of some of these incidents, I think that would, you know, directly tie back to what our responsibility is. So it's not as much about, yes, this is how many times this department discharged a weapon, but as a result of incidents of discharging a weapon, this is the lesson learned, this is how training, training changed not just originally, but how did they improve as a result of? Uh, and I think the public you know, is of the impression that they'll see an incident and the department just goes about its merry way and nothing changes. And it'd be good to be able to enumerate that that's, that's clearly not the case. Mm -hmm. oh, what, what I would add to uh, Brian's uh, comment is that uh, from what I hear, uh, Major, is that Sharice is laying this out. And I would agree uh, from a systemic point of view. So if there is an incident of discharge of weapon, it uh, goes back to what uh, Pastor Burton said, that if you look uh, systemically at what happened in Philadelphia, as far as the information we have at hand in this conversation, discharge of weapon, but then what was the root cause of that? And he's saying that, as far as he knows, they didn't have tasers, uh, so there was less lethal force. Then why didn't they have tasers? So you do the why question process. They didn't have tasers because there wasn't the funding for it, you know, or they didn't have the tasers. They didn't get the training on tasers. The only thing they had at disposal was a, a revolver if, if, mm -hmm. or a block. And that's what they, and so they fear for their life as, as we hear. And then that's what happened. So I, th I think it's important from this point of view, uh, Major, is to look at these things systemically as these incidents occur. What's the systemic nature behind that occurring? And that gets into the workforce development part of that, the conversation, I think. It's not so much uh, the witch hunt as far as who did what, when, and how. But his point is, at the point of the incident, uh, where do we go from here in terms of uh, the, uh, communication uh, and what's the procedures in place for that and in terms of um, uh, training uh, and how do we look at that? But, but there's a systemic view of, of, of the injuries, of the other issues. Uh, and, and I think this whole list would look at these things systemically in terms of why questioning and root cause analysis to get to the workforce development part so that we design it out that these things or these incidents occur less and less in the future from a workforce development standpoint. That's what I'm interpreting with Sharice's display. Yeah, thank, thank you, Keith, for laying that out in that way for me, because that's exactly what I was thinking is, is that we oftentimes, when you see these incidents take place, we don't get an opportunity to examine the why. And I'd like to think that, you know, before you get there, or ultimately as you get there, you do do a root cause analysis, which moves us back to, uh, in the example that Frank gave, is that who knew? How is it possible that anybody would know that you're forced to use lethal force because that's all you got? Um, you know, and you don't, you don't know that. So chief, you had, you had that chief Hughes. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, Sean, when I'm, when I'm looking over this now and I look at this slide and think about it, um, I think that over time, if we were capturing, if we capture this data now and over time, as we move along, which I suspect, and I believe that we should, there's going to be some changes made to potentially some of our training pieces, the de-escalation mm -hmm. and some of our response to resistant, it would be nice to compare. Now, given the fact that there are lots of different variables that go into every single situation, but at least it creates a bit of a, a baseline. I believe that this data is gonna be captured in a number of other groups as well. Mm -hmm. So, it, and, and for us and for most police agencies in Delaware, this is an easy capture because we're capturing it already. You know, mm -hmm. We have that information. Um, but I did wanna make one other point. Uh, yes, go ahead. To that. And when Tori was talking about some of the training pieces that they're doing uh, in Smyrna, then very and they do they've got some great stuff happening there in Smyrna but it goes back to on our original slide it talks about capacity and funding of our various agencies mm -hmm. um and Smyrna I'm, I'm gonna brag on Tory he's done a great job he's a great leader doing a wonderful job he doesn't have the biggest budget in the world but he has a good a good size budget but there are some agencies Georgetown in particular that mm -hmm. anything beyond paying salaries and OECs is going to have to come out of a grant somewhere um, we're just not that kind of a community. We're not, uh, you know, very affluent community. Uh, it is what it is. And so we, we do those things. So that is going to be a big piece as we move through this, and especially around training. I'm a huge advocate for training. 
but we've got to find that. And I don't want to fall back on, oh, I just don't have the money. Well, I don't have the money. Mm-hmm. Do those kind of things. But well, 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 I'm I think that you. would be very important ahead, to look. I think that would be very important as we look at workforce development and training or what resources are being allocated, um, whether, you know, there is a reliance or a need for state or a reliance on federal funding. And it sounds like not local. But I do think that these guidelines um, and looking at these incidents of violence and engagement and uh, physical altercations um, and preparing that will be informative for workforce development and training. But it, because I think all of the subcommittees were looking for transparency and to establish legitimacy and trust um, with the law enforcement and community. And I think that creates a venue for that. As you just said, uh, Chief Hughes, and using it as a benchmark over time, doing other trainings, how we might see these reduce as we begin to uh, invest more in providing uh, officers with the resources and the training that they need to deal with the complex issues on the street. Mm-hmm. Chief Tory, did you have something? Uh, you know, it's just like Chief Hughes said, um, this, is, this is definitely a financial impact on not departments, but also the towns. Um, so that's definitely something that we do need to kind of take into consideration. I am very fortunate enough to have that funding that's there um, because when I go for my budget yearly, I, I make sure that I stress that these are the important things that we have to have um, just to kind of keep us a, a above the board with everything else that's going on. So um, that is something to look at. You know, I have 26 officers. We're not state police who have 700 officers. So, you know, that is going to be a huge, huge impact on somebody's, somebody's budget. Mm-hmm. And, and major, major, mm-hmm. uh, major, just to get back to your point and your question about uh, try to, 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 to make it clear, I know that Keith and Sharice and Brian and, and Chief Hughes kind of said it too, uh, but our mindset when we were labeling this was um, in terms of training again. So when we start talking about training, one of the things that I think about from my experience is mindset. So take you back 30 some years ago as a a new FBI agent on the street with the task force, member from the Philadelphia Police Department. Um, He's 50 something, almost 60. I'm in my early twenties. We roll out in North Philly and all of a sudden he rolls up on a corner in a car, rolls up on the corner physically, pulls out a baton and puts all these guys up on the wall well, you, you can't do that anymore. So as far as um, discharge of weapon, our mindset was this. So with this new generation and the de-escalation and everything that's going on, we can't do policing like we used to do it. So I, I, I normally say it like this. Um, change is easy because change is inevitable. What's going to happen? But transition where we're trying to get to now is difficult because transition requires a change of mindset. So again, with the old officers, new officers, new day, new age, new situation, we have to take a look at these. Now, one older officer, and this is not the case in in Philadelphia, I'm just saying, an older officer may be what people call trigger happy, quick to pull, you know, while a newer officer may use de-escalation training and techniques because he's been trained that way. So I think our mindset was to that when we labeled this, if that makes sense to you. No, I think it's great. I think uh, all the explanations and the perspectives are really important. Uh, I'm a trainer, uh, quite a bit of training that I do. I believe in it wholeheartedly. Everything that everybody's saying, I'm right on point with. My was just a more of a technical question about how that relates back to the impetus of how we're looking at that training in terms of workforce development and the duplicity. I just didn't want to avoid a little bit of duplicity of information, but it makes sense of the overlap. And maybe we're going to find out some different information how it relates back. Yeah. Specific yeah. Training yeah. So I think, and, I, thank you. I think it's great. No, no. And I, I appreciate that. And I, I am really ha- uh, happy for the dialogue and, um, and, you know, everything that's here is, is negotiable um, to a point because we're, we're working together and you all are extremely, extremely important um, in adding your perspective and, and looking at what we pay attention to. And I, I, I guarantee you that this is just, um, you know, uh, uh, areas to start. I think as we start to scratch the surface and as 
Bruce said, you know, as we were looking more and more at uh, content and detail that's been provided to us, the aha is going to be more like, oh boy, and did you know? And so um, I think we'll find out more. And I, I don't ever want, uh, or nor would I participate in an environment that's just giving detail, just giving the facts. And I think some, some of the, um, the other committees in their work and what have you, that it, when, you, when you give, and I know they have important work too, but when you give that content in and of itself, without connecting the dots as to where it goes and how it gets there is, is a lot of what we're gonna be doing, I think in this particular group. Ruth, did you have something and we'll move on to the last I, two? I did, I was just gonna to say to tie those two thoughts that we just had from, you know, from, from Major Moriarty on with the other discussion is that um, what we're looking at here is maybe how this fits into a progressive or constructive discipline and training kind of issue, where if you're realizing there's this deficiency or if there's something where a person might be progressing um, with physical engagement and violence that once again, you're able to, to see you're actually looking for perhaps a, a pattern or something that's starting to emerge and you can be proactive and getting additional training before another incident or something happens. And I do think there's certain things now that are being monitored um, closer than what they had been before for that. And it's just, we come back once again to the next discussion is about resources. Um, and, and certainly for smaller agencies that either do not have the level of, um, certainly the level of education or leadership or even the number of people to engage in some of these programs, how could we turn and maybe offer them um, assistance um, to provide that so that where you have some smaller departments maybe can rely on a larger resource um, to do some of those things so that we're, we're consistent because I think in any of this when we talk about transparency and accountability I think our people are looking at consistency so it doesn't matter if it's a state agency um, if it's a county law enforcement or maybe um, a town or municipality, that there's some level of consistency because I think once again, that if you think things are the same, rather with relatively the same with how things are treated, um, that, that that helps dispel a lot of myth and it helps give people a comfort level. So I look forward to the discussion, I think, which is a huge one on funding and capacity. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna turn off, I've been talking enough. I'm gonna turn now to, to Frank to go over the last two tasks. You know, what, Next. you know what, Sharice, if you could continue, because I'm getting some great notes. Uh, okay, you're taking the notes. Okay, so let's oh, move. Man, I'm getting some great stuff. Slide. Very, very good notes. Okay, so here we go. You don't have the resource, you can't get it done. So task three, to Chief Hughes's point, and to, to Ruth's point, funding and capacity policies and procedures. And here are the core areas that we think will be included, but it's not limited, right? So is federal money, which we know is what? Funny money, it's fickle. We don't know if it's coming or going, right? Depends on the administration, depends on um, your ability to, co to compete, it depends on your application, it depends on the state awards, it depends on a lot of things, it's uncertain. Local resources, is the township uh, invested? City, county, state, whatever invested in. State funding trends and looking at it from a five to 10 year range. And we're, we're trying to find, scratching the services and trying to find these resources in and of itself. But as I said, it's not, it's a hodgepodge, if you will, of how you get what you get. And if you make a good application or et cetera, or in some instances, um, I um, almost think about it like in the terms of a lottery, who gets what, or who gets to get what, um, as an example. And I'll give you an example uh, in, in working in juvenile justice um, years ago uh, in, in adult corrections, our set monies. And I don't know if anybody remembers those resources. They were residential substance abuse treatment resources. There were only two entities in the state or federally uh, that were authorized to get them that were adults. These are persons who were uh, incarcerated who could get those resources um, for treatment inside of prisons and juveniles. But guess who always got them? The adults got them because the numbers were larger. So until, you know, at the time when I was director, I, you know, studied, paid attention. You know, you don't know what you don't know because I had worked an adult mostly. And I asked a question to say, why did we never get any of these resources? I mean, ultimately it might help in a big way if we could stop, you know, the progression of crime of young people who might be experiencing substance abuse before they got to adults. We began to get it. It still was at a smaller rate than it was for adults because the capacity was so much larger, but just looking and asking those questions versus our norm is 
let's take care of the larger problem versus dealing with the other and what the return on investment potentially might be or whatever the reasons are that we're using for the funding formulas that we, we did. And that was an example. It's not a who's who or whatever. It was just the way we did things in, in, in and of itself. That was years ago. So now also looking at access to funding resources. Um, uh, how does Delaware stack up? I want to think we'll stack up pretty good depending on how this election turns up. But how is Delaware stack up <laughs> as it relates to funding sources? and resources coming to the state and the, and the folks that we have, local, city, county, uh, and statewide that can assist us in congressionally uh, in the resources that come to the state. And so from that perspective, uh, what does that mean in terms of access to capital, access to funding sources, access to you know who's advocating in that regard? And, and ultimately, where's the technical assistance um, support for the Georgetown Police Department versus the state police department who might have a built-in grant writer or someone else or, or et cetera. What, what does that look like? Is there some entity that makes sure that those things happen so that everything is equitable in terms of the needs in Georgetown and the needs over here? I don't know. And then application to funding sources and the capacity again that we said to make applications. So this to me is like where the rubber meets the road. We don't know what we don't know yet about all the things that are happening, but clearly, if you're struggling, uh, whether it's getting back to that voluntary, involuntary overtime and, and burning your men out over there, Chief Hughes, and women, uh, because all you got is 26 versus, you know, what, what you know, Tori has over here and what Sean has over there or whomever. I mean, whatever, however it looks like, you know, what are you going to do? And what does that mean in terms of output um, in the community, crime, wear and tear on your staff? in general, you know, what, what does that mean in and of itself? What do we want it to mean and how do we build in that regard if it's an issue in a particular area? So I'm going to stop there talking. I know a lot of folks got a lot to say about the money. So um, what are your thoughts? Keith, I see you smiling. What you thinking? <laughs> I, I just want to respond and say, I'm I, I, I going to concur with your perspective on this. Uh, and I like the example of Georgetown uh, versus Smyrna. Uh, and you wonder how can this be uh, that we don't have, um, and, and, and everybody's left to fend for themselves. So mm -hmm. we're dealing with this systemically. Uh, how do we begin to understand this, this slide here, what the network of availability and or sourcing is with this slide here? And then how do we set up a, a systemic approach within Delaware so that we take care of our own the way that we balance out funding uh, for the uh, communities that don't have as much uh, relative to the ones that do, so that we balance out the delivery of this service of policing. So I, I look at all of this as a, a, really feeding into a systemic strategy to support mm -hmm. across Delaware. Mm -hmm. That's the thought. Yes, sir, Corey. Thank you, Keith. Corey, you're on mute. Can you unmute yourself? Let's see. There you go. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Question is about more about because I see these these bullet points are about gaining more funding, allocation of of current funding, budgeting. So it could be it could be either or. So let's just put let's just put it out there. The okay. whole notion about defunding the police. No, 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 not defunding. No, 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 no. I'm not saying okay. you're saying that. I'm okay. just saying I'm saying let's just put it out there in that when you talk about, not you personally, but when you talk about in general, that's the vernacular that's going on across the country in, in more in some locales than others, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm saying we don't know what we don't know right now about funding in the state of Delaware. We don't know what Chief Hughes situation is and what Tory's situation is and what Major Sean's situation is and or anybody else as it relates to to that to even begin to have the dialogue about well okay so do we keep it like we have it or do we look at restructuring or do we look at whatever you know trying to get ahead of it and again i think our purpose is tell the story what is that what is it and what does it look like so so i didn't mean to interrupt you but i'm just and you didn't infer that it's just that it was a random thought that crossed my mind before it went away okay. <laughs> So, so to be clear, I'm not talking defunding, but reallocation of funds based on 
almost on what you was talking about in, in task two, looking at the numbers of incidents and blah, 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 how they play out, could we have used resources a little bit differently? So as an example, just some stuff that's in the current news, the use of police dogs versus could, if you took a police dog away, would Philadelphia have more tasers? So looking at instances of are we using, how often are police dogs used? Is it worth the resources? Like that. So, and it could be on many other tools that the um, officers are using. Is that funding being used for the betterment of the community and the safety of, of both community and officers? Mm -hmm. What well, yeah. makes me, it makes me think, and not in response, but I just want to give an example, a recent example, and this is something I called up Representative Cook about um, um, thinking that something should perhaps maybe go out from the task force chairs about this. I thought it was a it was great in that uh, the federal grant that came into the city of Wilmington to fund the body cams that they had, I forget how many it was, but it was 600 and some odd thousand dollars that came in just for that purpose, right? And so the community at large has been talking about, well, why doesn't the city have body cams? You know, what's going on? And so they just, I think there was an assumption that somehow it was part of the, the funding in and of itself. Well, in addition to that, I read that the, the mayor also put in another 4 million to ensure that there were administrative officers. So they bought the body cams to go to the current complement, but the mayor put in the money for like 4 million or so for administration of several staff to oversee the programming of it. You know, the review, the surveillance and those kinds of things and what have you. And are, are folks aware even about the cost of that versus it asks for that to get that resource versus let's look at doing something different or let's reallocate what we have and all of those things. So I think everything is 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 uh, on the table. I will tell you from sitting um, on the Criminal Justice Council for years and as a designee is that, and I can imagine what happens within the scope of these budgets is that folks, oh, there's a little one. Alexandra, I see, sell it, hi. <laughs> But um, in the scope of these budgets and what have you, it's like pulling your hair out when it's budget time, trying to figure out how do you do X and what do you cut and what do you save and all of those things. I, I don't know. So I think we just have to have these conversations. We have to do our homework. We've got to pull that detail out and make sure that we, we get good content, good information back. So we at least have a starting point. Okay. All right. So let's move on to the next. Anybody else have any burning thoughts about money? We, ne we need money or we need some aspect of money. We need to find out where the money is. Right. Okay. So next task. Task force d d uh, four. This is a biggie. Um, these are our general operating policies, procedures, and code of conduct. And here the areas are uh, laws that authorize police entity structures and authorities. They may vary. Uh, we've got the Delaware code. We'll look at that content, have that information. We also need to look very specifically at our bargaining agreements, whether that's FOP uh, and other entities, is it different in the county, city, state, and et cetera? What exactly do those entities say? What are the fiscal term, fiscal um, uh, implications of that and expectations? What are the terms of those? How, you know, what, what's the time frames in which they're negotiated? What does that mean? In other er significant areas, deemed by the bargaining unit, whatever is important to them. Is there, you know, guidelines in there around over time, who gets it and seniority and all of that business and what have you, do we understand what the differences are between those contractual um, uh, 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 contracts in and of itself, those labor management agreements and expectations? Are we are as aware about uh, who, who's, who's, uh, who's minding the store, so to speak? Are we following those guidelines? I'd like to pride myself that previously when I've had management labor agreements, I wanted to make sure I knew as much about that labor management agreement as my as the, the, the bargaining members, you know, do you know what happens? Are we working towards uh, making sure that we're honoring those? Are we negotiating in good state? I don't know. I mean, we just don't know what, what that looks like or enough that we can find that information. Workplace culture, physical and emotional environment, where are the complaints coming from? Are we getting a lot of complaints from, from internally? Uh, not only we know there's, there's issues that come up with the public, but from within our entities and our policing entities, who's complaining? Are they complaining? What do the complaints look like? The type and the disposition, the demographics, who are the complainants, gender, race, ethnicity, of course, age, and the length of service. What's, what's happening as it relates to that? Are we getting in 
any? Are we getting none? Are we getting a lot? Are we getting some? Are we getting them in certain areas, certain counties? Don't, don't know, but I think that will help us get an idea about code of conduct policies and things of that. Code of conduct handbooks, do you have them? Does everybody have them? Is an expectation, um, is the oath of office around what you should do uh, and et cetera, those kinds of things and what have you, mission statements, all of that stuff and what have you, what's there? And the anti-discrimination policies um, for, for all uh, protected classes. What does that mean as it relates to the policies and what have you? Are any of these things kind of feeding up perhaps maybe potentially in the complaints? And then in some instances, complaints sometimes feed into some of the disciplinary and corrective action oriented kinds of things that, that kind of shape up. So that's the scope of what that looks like around uh, policies and what have you, and looking at how we do, how police do what they do, and are they doing what they say they do, you know, those kinds of things, but do we understand what that looks like? Do we have any entities that don't have policies and procedures or codes of conduct and, and things of that nature? Yes, sir, Keith. Uh, one of the things, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if it fits on this page or not, but uh, it comes to mind as you're going through this list, so is, is a review of training curriculums. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the variety of training curriculums, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. jurisdiction by jurisdiction, and what's mm -hmm. the practices and yeah. how they're being uh, incorporated? I don't know where it fits into. Yeah, we put that, I think, in number uh, in the first group, which was the workforce develop professional development recruitment and retraining. Uh, okay, I missed that. Attention. Right. That's okay. Um, to right. look at uh, the training curriculums to make sure like where's there and as you said, the level of review, you know, how often are they reviewed, updated, things of that nature and what have you, that that Got would it. be a, that would be a section. Got um, it. Thank so, you. Yes, Actually, um, I'm sorry, yes, Keith, hey. um, Keith brought up a great point. So which is something that I wanted to see if we can add to this slide. Mm -hmm. um, as far as frequency, so how often are we reviewing these policies and procedures and, and under what circumstances are we reviewing them? Um, so if there's like an incident, um, you know, will that cause us to, will that make us look at the policies and procedures? Mm -hmm. And so just, you know, making sure that we're constantly um, looking at, you know, ourselves critically uh, to make sure that we don't get to a place where like 20 years from now, you know, we're kind of like in this tough spot, right? Like, mm -hmm. darn, we kind of digged ourselves in this hole. So yeah. how are we, how often, and if someone from law enforcement, you know, wants to speak to that right now, um, as far as like how often are their policies and procedures updated and under, you know, which cases are they, are they changed? I would say this, I, instead of, it, it, I don't, I'm, I'm careful to put our, folks who are on on the spot unless they want to share but i think if in looking at to, i don't want to that, force anyone to, to talk no no, no. understood i'm just saying we're looking at all of it and i think you make a very good point is that you're right is it only at the point of crisis that we're looking at something or is it a uh, part of a review uh an annual review or scheduled review or you know in general that we're looking at these kinds of things you, you make that's ex extremely important you know, how often are we looking at it? Is it something that's, we didn't change it for 20 years and it, and it is the way it is, but that has nothing to do with today? I don't know. Representative King, thank you, Kayla. Yeah, thank you. I, I wanted to follow up on that because that's a very good comment because I had noted in some of my review with some of the policies where they would talk about that um, for community relations or different things where they were doing an annual review. And I think, well, that's a little... Uh, it, an annual review is not frequent enough. Some of this needs to be looked at and reviewed more frequently, quarterly or whatever. And maybe they are doing that, but they're just doing one formal report. So, um, you know, whether it be with, with community relations, which are very important, or whether it be some of the other stuff to be know that you're having this 360 evaluation that is an ongoing process so that you, you don't wait, um, you know, for certain things to occur before you're addressing that you're looking for a pattern or a practice that you can, you know, address this time as you go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to that end too, the, the thing that make you, Kaylin, you, you, you started to shake something loose with me is to say, not only is it the, the, the interval in which is looking at, do they have an entity that's looking at it? Is there a policy person that's looking at this stuff? Or is it somebody that has this task added on in addition to <laughs> working involuntary overtime no <laughs> but but it could very well be or you know I don't know how that happens and that's not calling anyone into question it's just like you know it would be good to have someone that all they do is is that they're you know a policy reviewer they're looking or, at policy and paying attention 
or peer review because a I mean, review. The association yeah. of police chiefs and maybe, maybe well, here's, we don't know what we don't know. They're probably already doing this to a certain degree. We just don't know that. And if so, we would just, it would be nice to know. It'd be nice to know. Yeah. Be nice to know. Okay. So that's the scope. Those are, yes, sir, Chief Hughes. Okay. For the, it would be nice to know. Yes. There's, we call it, it's DPAC, Delaware Police Accreditation Count Commission. And so um, to Kaylin's question about how often it is on an annual basis, but, but keep in mind, uh, once an agency is accredited, you go through an entire process that all of your, all of your, you meet all of the standards. And so for Delaware accreditation, it's about 112 standards, mm -hmm. but in those 112, there are many subgroups. So mm -hmm. you actually have a lot more policies and procedures closer. I think for us, we're around, I think it's like 230 now, this is just for the Georgetown Police Department, because it's going to be different if Sean Moriarty talks and where he's in a, a CALEA agency in the state police. They have a lot more standards. It's probably up to 450 or so now that they have to meet. But those standards you have to go through and you make sure that all your you address all of the standards and you comply and you it must be done annually every year. Mm -hmm. So you have on site assessors will come and take a look and make sure your policies are up to date. And so when I say annually, you think, well, only it's once a year. Well, you have to be doing this all year long. You can't just wait until the end of the year to do it. Mm -hmm. So many of those policies or standards touch on others. So we're looking, we are looking at them, but to the point of, boy, wouldn't it be nice to have a policy person to be doing that? I don't have that luxury. And even though I said, Tori's got a great up there in Smyrna, I'm pretty sure he doesn't have a, just a it's single no. policy guy up there. So we need to make sure um, it's, I do that, my lieutenant, my captain, we're, we are the accreditation managers, if you will. And so mm -hmm. our, our other responsibilities, we need to do that. And so as we move through the state, so as speaking from, on, from the police chief's council, there is a big push on the police chief's council to get all agencies in Delaware to the DPAC level, Delaware Police Accreditation uh, Council level. And we are working through that. A number of agencies um, have, are working through that process. And um, and then and then COVID hit, and that caused some problems with the assessors coming out. Um, but we are working towards that. It take it's going to take some time to get there, but that's a that's a very good start. And then there are several of our agencies: Delaware State Police, Wilmington Police, Newcastle County Police, Millsboro Police Department. Um, and I know I'm missing. I think there's there's the Dover, Dover Police Dover. Department. And is Smyrna Kalia? No, we're not. We're actually going through the DPAC right now. Okay. Um, yeah. And so I think there's seven agencies that are CALEA, which is it's a larger and more standards there, which is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. However, there's a, a cost associated with that. And then there's meeting some other things. So, but to the DPAC, I'm, I have to tell you, I'm very pleasantly, I'm pleased with how uh, the police chiefs have embraced this. And this has started back last, at the end of last year, 2019, um, started down this path. It's just taking a process. But that is, that's exactly where it should be, though, in task number four, to your point. That should be there about policy review and what that process is. I think that's important for folks to understand. That, that's an excellent point. Okay, cool. Chief Tori, did you have something? No. Uh, Chief uh, Hughes pretty much said everything. Chief Hughes, and then we'll get to you, Keith. You, Sean, you okay? Uh, yeah, I was just going to add, I think the Chief did a great job of summarizing uh, what it is. It's, uh, I think it's 459 standards on the Kalia Avenue. So it's quite a bit, but there is. It's a tremendous amount of work to be able to do that. And now they actually change it up. So in addition to an annual review, because of the changes, not only because of COVID, because of the virtual environment, we're actually doing more frequency of events or a different way of looking at it, rather than assessors actually coming and looking at the books, let's say, you know, every you know, couple of years or a year it's coming on a more frequent basis of actually sending that information too. But I thought it was a great, great point that was also raised at the start of this, this trend of conversation is that it's not just the annual reviews or the semi-annuals or the quarterly, there is absolutely follow up on specific policies you know, after incidents. So those after action reports and those after action incidents, whether it be on a specific level or one officer or a national level or a state level or a group level, it's very important that those policies are reiterated and gone over. But it shouldn't wait to those events. So I think Kaylin's point is 100% on par. It shouldn't wait just for those. It needs to be a, a frequency for review and also doing it. But one thing to think about too is all these things play into the larger realm of time, right? Mm -hmm. Time, resources, money that we've been talking about the whole evening. But time not only for preparing, for reviewing, for creating, 
for updating, but also then you've got the training avenue, the time it takes to train. So when you look at the overall workforce development, I think it's important to consider that the officers that are that are actually doing what would be considered traditional police work and community service, whatever that may be, you know, um, protect and serve and, and enhancing the quality of life and all those traditional things we think about, traffic enforcement, criminal investigations, all those things. Now you add the training component in, which is absolutely essential, but it's always a balance of time. You only have so many resources, whether it be a one person department or you know, an agency the size of ours, with you know, 715, 720 troopers, we're obviously balancing all those things because if you take somebody up for training, that's one less person that's out there actually doing those traditional police services. So it's mm -hmm. a fine balance to understand that, you know, tie, tie in all the things that we've been talking about here today to provide the best level. And I think this is a great, great platform to get that done. Mm -hmm. So I applaud you for bringing this up. Great, great questions. Awesome. So Keith, and we're going to- Yeah, I just, I just, I just want to, <clears throat> I don't want to go to solution, uh, but, but this brings to mind uh, that uh, what Chief Hughes was saying with the, uh, the, the, the Chiefs Association, mm -hmm. uh, the question is, how do we begin to take advantage of our scale? Uh, meaning that Delaware is a small state uh, and, and we should be taking advantage of that in terms of taking advantage of our scale. Mm -hmm. And, and if, if one agency versus the other in terms of budget and staffing, the, the centralizing a person or persons to do a policy review uh, agency by agency I can't understand why, <clears throat> uh, this reminds me of when I lived in New Jersey, you drive across the street and you're in another town, you go three more blocks in another town and all of them have city managers, all of them have fire departments, all of them have police departments, but they were a square block of, apart from each other. It mm -hmm. didn't make sense. And so they weren't taking advantage of scale. I, I, this reminds me of that, is the, in that if we're talking about policing, policing is policing is policing to me. Uh, so then policies and procedures and code of conduct should be almost universal in terms of mm -hmm. standards of our scale. Mm -hmm. And well, then why would we have a team of policy wonks that, and procedure wonks that would then look at, examine mm -hmm. agency by agency, and then codify that to that we have some, some things that are just across the board similar. So that uh, when we get to the point then, to the point that was just made around training, then we have a training academy that is is similar, is consistent, is mm -hmm. advantage of our scale, is cost effective. Why is every agency trained, it has to train staff and has to staff the, to do the training, et cetera. So we're duplicating efforts uh, agency by agency of things that really are consistent, should be applied consistently. So mm -hmm. again, I wanna go to the solution, but one of the principles here should be taking advantage of our scale and structuring our mindset around this in a way that's different than what it is right now, trying to structure system and processes, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. this whole notion of policing. Mm -hmm. You make a good, you make a very good point. We've got to move on because we look, we're almost close to six, and we got to get public comment. But um, again, Keith, I think it's really important when you talk about approaches and strategies and things of the way we look at this work is as we're looking at what's the worldview across. I think ultimately we may end up coming to some of these kinds of things, who knows, but it, it, it makes sense. Delaware is a, a, a doable state because we are such a small state. Um, you know, we get to do a lot of things, I think, well, because we only have three counties and things of that nature. So, you know, we've got uh, diversity and in some instances we have sameness when we're looking at gold standard opportunities and what have you. So we'll see what we, what we end up coming up with, but thank you for that. Next slide. Um, those are the four folks. And I just want to say to you is that we want you to grab on, um, look at the tasks that you want to work on. Um, we've got a majority of you signed up, those who you're not signed up. I promise you by Friday, we, we, you know, we're going to call you. We want you to answer the phone. Uh, we'd like to have you self-select. We don't want to volunteer you uh, for, for those groups. But if, if, you, if you could, not groups, but tasks, um, if you could, that would be really, really great in terms of the place that uh, is of interest to you, the place that you think you can make some uh, contribution and those things. And we're going to also bring you, give you some additional information, contact detail, as you said before, Keith, about, you know, how do you get, who do you get to, who do you talk to? And then some of the survey detail and, and information that we uh, have already uh, put together that we asked for on the front end of this entire process to be able to share so that you can read um, and keep up with, you know, where we are. We know what the labor management agreements are, things of that nature, what have you, so we can look at those things and, 
et cetera, read through them and be prepared. Um, and I'm telling you guys now for the month of November, we're going to take off November. So next one, task assignments. This is what we're talking about here in terms of these things. Please, please, please let us know where you want to work uh, and what have you. You're going to get uh, content as it relates to um, the detail around um, information we knew in survey, information that we've gotten uh, from the police entities already, information that we were able to contrive from their public websites, things of that nature and what have you um, that we'll share with you that might help inform some of the some of the areas that you want to you want to work on. Next slide. Schedule. Uh, we'd like to take a first look in December. Uh, we're taking off the month of November. Um, uh, Representative Cook, just letting you all know you and Daryl down there, you know, we said we would meet monthly, but November is almost shot. We've got one, two, three, four, four holidays in November. And then we were trying to have us all match dates, if you will, for the four committees and not work the staff half to death. And so we decided that we would take off for November uh, for a, a physical meeting, but we would leave that time actually to do our homework and do some of the reading and, and research and things of, of that nature uh, for, for, for folks. And then in December, when we meet, and we'll send out the save the date so you all will have that because we're still trying to manipulate that too, knowing that December is a busy month as well for, for folks, is, is that we wanna take a first look at these areas and see what your thoughts are and some of the details. So we want you to do that reading, do that research, do that review, say where you wanna you know, zero in on the area you would want to work the particular task, let us know that, um, let us know what you need you know, in and of itself so we can help to direct that work. And then ultimately do that during the scope of the month of November and then be prepared in December to have this kind of conversation. We're gonna just get right to it and have some, some, some talk about like we did today in each one of the areas very succinctly. And we'll have a template for us to be able to do that. That'll help us direct as to where we go in the first part of the year to be able to inform uh, Representative Cook and Daryl uh, Parsons, our co-chairs around what our first, came, what we came up with initially. Okay. All right. What do we have next? Public comment. And I don't know that we have, do we have anybody on from the public today? Any public comment staff? We do have members of the public that are attending the meeting. So at this time, if you wish to give public comment, please utilize the raise hand function in Zoom. Cynthia Smith, you are now permitted to speak. You have two minutes. Hi, my name is Cynthia Smith. I watched the, um, the first meeting and I thought someone had addressed a funding for re-entry as you know, pertains to workforce uh, for returning citizens. So I think um, I did send today uh, a copy of a, uh, a link for uh, Road to Ruins. It's about um, we have 9,000 plus Delawareans who lost, uh, who, who don't have, uh, who, whose driver's license is suspended. 6,238 licenses revoked. Um, my, my information are, are being sent to you guys because I just sent it earlier. So uh, going back to the task one and four, I think that that can easily receive, I mean, provided by law enforcement. We are still heavily, um, um, I think the, the, the participation in this workforce committee is still heavily uh, represented by law enforcement. So I think that those information could have been just obtained by, from them. Also, the, um, the use of force that, um, uh, material, I had sent that. So maybe some of you who have no, uh, I mean, would like to know more what what is best practice, I did send that, and de-escalation strategies. I wanna thank Representative Briggs for returning my call. I do want to, uh, to um, in, you know, moving forward, I hope that this task force would have memorandum of un understanding to include the discretionary uh, decision they might make for not following the law. I also, um, we need to know, uh, we need to revisit how law enforcement is training the department generating income, i.e. maybe uh, if, if the law enforcement uh, department is heavily, uh, you know, uh, depending on the ticket 
And this is what I've been hearing for four, three uh, different uh, task force committees. So I'm thinking that uh, we need to uh, adhere to the new normal. We need to look at, we need to put back those people that are uh, back to work. Thank you, Mrs. Smith, your time is up. Thank if you, you wish- do we, do we have anyone else from the public? If you wish to give public comment, please utilize the raise hand function at this time. Doesn't appear that we have any additional public comment. Okay, all right, very good. I think that we are right at the bottom. It's, this has been a wonderful meeting. Uh, I thank you all so much for your contribution. I hope you feel free to not only do it during the scope of this meeting, but also um, feel free to contact Frank or myself. Uh, and again, we're gonna be reaching out to you all uh, also, um, but we really would like very much for you to kind of look at those tasks, see which tasks you'd like to work on, um, you know, give feedback about and et cetera. We're gonna send a template out by which to, to, to report in to this uh, group in December. Um, and um, I think that's where we are. I believe that's, the, that's, that's where we are at the end, are we not? I don't see our uh, agenda. May, may I just say, um, I would Please. like to thank um, the public comment from Ms. Smith and her comments, and I appreciate the, her participation in the meeting today. So thank you for attending, and Absolutely. thank you for your engagement and bringing a community perspective. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ms. Smith. And did we lose I have her? A question. I don't see her there. Um, Is she still there? Cynthia, I think she's off the call. Oh, okay. All right. So we'll um, make sure we make a get a note to her to thank her for that. Um, and uh, any detail, I guess, that she provided. Um, I know she sent that to who she sent that to maybe to um, our, um, our staffers, but we'd love to see it. So thank you so much. Um, and members of the public are invited at any particular time was uh, last thoughts, any other thoughts? Yeah, Kaylin. I have um, a question and a thought, I guess. So I'll make it really quick. Um, my first question is, uh, are we gonna receive the names of the folks who will be working on these tasks with us before our December meeting so we can yes. connect and, okay. Yes. And, yes. Um, and one more thing to add, I was doing a little bit of research and I'm not sure if, uh, if everyone is familiar with the COPS initiative out of the Department of Justice's office. Mm -hmm. um, COPS stands for Community Oriented Policing Services. Mm -hmm. uh, they um, they uh, had this documentary um, out of Camden. Um, they worked with their county police officers and was able to lower the, uh, the violence rate, um, the use of force rates and I, um, I emailed them to see if I can get a meeting, um, but we may, you know, want to see if they can come and speak to this group or the general task force um, about their work um, and also the grants that they awarded a few Delaware agencies in 2020. Um, and, and again, it is federal money. So <laughs> I know what you said at the beginning, Sharice. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little, it could be funny, but um, <laughs> they did um, award Dover PD, Laurel PD, um, Newark PD, with some, with some money over the summer um, to help fund um, positions within those agencies mm -hmm. that are there. So the cops are trained by the cops office and it's cops mm -hmm. by cops. So the community oriented policing services office mm -hmm. trained these uh, police officers uh, that they've um, funded in these different agencies. And I can send a link uh, to, I'll send a link to you and Frank so everyone can see uh, the list of agencies that receive funding, but yeah, it was yeah. over, I think, $400 million in funds was awarded to these agencies, and everyone was given $125,000 per uh, COPS officer. Okay, so, that's I'll great, that's great. Let me, let me just clarify too, um, yes, I do believe federal money, is, when I say funny money, it's just like it's here today and it's gone tomorrow, but we would not be able to survive, um, many of us and many agencies without the support of the federal government. I mean, we, we know that in federal uh, grants that come in and what have you, and that includes uh, my own agency, USDOL. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, um, for, for our agency in and of itself, we're probably about like, uh, what is it, about 70-30? Uh, 70% federal, 30% state. So, so you know, these are things that, that we're all aware of uh, in and of itself. But thank you so much, Kaylin, for that. That will help a lot in terms of looking at things that we do. And again, when we talked about models, best practices and things of like that, 
we want to pay attention to to those and i would hope that we'd have a whole listing uh, of entities and what have you particularly interested in those that have invested in delaware uh you know previously so that that is really great detail i saw a hand key yes uh-huh uh very quickly uh sharice can you give us a view of the the flow of, uh in december i know we're going to take november off and do home research uh, uh, but then once we have our team designated uh, in December, are we going to meet with the team and then come together as a group? What's the flow in December that we're looking at? Well, let me say this to you is that um, we were and keep you, you, I think you would not had not gotten had been able to get on yet. We were advised that we could not design ourselves around the work groups uh, it, for four year reasons. So what we've decided to do is to identify them per task. And so you all are very, very uh, uh, open to call each other and do whatever you like when you see who's working in your particular area. We'll share that information with you, but it's not a separate public meeting it, because it would be regarded as a separate public meeting if you were to convene yourselves and things of that nature and what have you. So, you know, I, you know, the recommendation is those of you of, of like mind share information with each other and work on these things uh, to get you got it. You know what I'm talking about. And so, so from that perspective, I think we'll be able to get to that end. Come December, in terms of our first look report out, we would expect those of you who have been um, interested in the same task and reviewing the data and those kinds of things to be able to give us content and report into larger group. And we're gonna send a template by which you do that, primarily around those three areas, looking at the report and comparative. So when you talk to us about Georgetown and talk to us about Smyrna and talk to us about state police, we at least have some sense across the board. Uh, and then also looking very much at, you know, um, you know, what are some of the best practices and where are some of the credentials and things, you know, we don't want to just look at the doom and gloom. We want to look at the whole picture. And so this will be our first scratch at it, if you will. And so November, I'd like to see November and suggest November is our homework month to go and read everything that we're going to share with you and everything that you can look and find and what Kaylin is going to uh, support us with uh, and any information that we get so that when we have this conversation, it's going to be fruitful. We'll give people We'll divide it so that it's very administrative low and heavy as it relates to the content that you all are gonna provide for the scope of this. I thought this meeting was great and obviously necessary, better than what we could have imagined because at one point we were planning to try to break you out into groups. Well, so much for ideas, this is so much better. So I'm really glad for the collective think that we've had today. So thank you so much for the participation and all of you today. Alexandra, we're gonna get you next time because you didn't say anything. We saw the baby. You didn't introduce us to the to the baby, but you didn't say anything. So next time, you're gonna be one of the first ones to have something to say. <laughs> she said yes. But thank you all so much. It's so great to see all of you all. And uh, as we you, call Sharice. you and talk to you, you know, uh, we look forward to it. If we don't see you again in person. Have a wonderful go vote and have a wonderful Veterans Day and have a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. I think Frank had something. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I, I, I was Frank, gonna, you had something? I was, I was just going to say, Shafiq, it was very productive. Uh, a great talk about uh, public comment was good. And I wanted to hone in on the last thing very quickly, what you said before. The very first thing that I said in our first meeting, we are only as strong as our weakest link. Yep. So we have to have everybody participate. So Alejandra, not just you, Paige is over there hiding. I've been Paige, watching. Paige, that's right, Paige. We saw you Paige, over there, Paige. Paige knows. Paige knows. I will. Paige knows, but we need everybody's input because that's how we work effectively. So, so in other words, Paige and Alexandra, you all can expect the call tomorrow from Frank and myself. Okay, <laughs> Frank Cook, did you have something to say? You didn't. Uh, so, with that, I'd like to take a motion to adjourn this wonderful meeting today. So moved, and thank you to our staff. They're doing an awesome job. Awesome. Thank job. you, so everybody. Can I, can, I, can I have a second? Second. Second. All everybody in favor, let's see some thumbs. All right. Thank you, everybody. Take care.